Welcome to a rather lengthy set of slides on trigonometric graphs. I just want to warn you guys ahead of time that this is going to be a long one, um, but you can probably shorten it up a lot and I'll show you how. Here are the objectives that we want to discuss in this video. And really it all boils down to uh, generalizing the rules for just graphing functions that we've already learned. We already know uh, the basics of you know what different things do to our graphs so let's refresh our memory and see how it will apply uh, to uh, a trig function because a trig function is really just a function right so let's say we have a standard old function all right f of x it's anything now if we change that to f of x plus c right we add a constant on the outside we know that that's going to shift it up if it's positive and shift it down if it's negative. What if we go to f of x plus c on the inside, right? It's on the inside of the function. Well, then we know it's going to shift it to the right or shift it to the left. And it's always counterintuitive on the inside, right? So if it's, if it's plus c, if it's a positive number, it's going to shift it to the left. And if it's minus c, so it looks like a negative number, it's actually going to shift it to the right. All right, well, what else do we have? Remember, we could um, multiply it by a constant. And that's going to stretch it or compress it, right? So stretch it or shrink it, right, in, in the vertical direction. It stretches it, makes it taller if A is bigger than 1. It compresses it, makes it shorter if A is between 0 and 1. Uh, absolute value of a is between 0 and 1. And then if we throw uh, a negative on the outside, then that kind of flips it, right? Flips it again in the vertical direction. Flips it over the x-axis. And then what if we instead put the constant on the inside of the function? Well, then we describe it as stretches and compressions in the horizontal direction and again it's counterintuitive so if a is bigger than one instead of stretching like it did in the vertical direction it compresses and then if a is between zero and one instead of compressing like it did in the vertical direction it stretches but remember that a stretch in the vertical direction is really the same thing as a compression in the horizontal direction because you can visualize these functions as like being made out of rubber, right? And if you pull a piece of rubber vertically, isn't it going to kind of suck in on the sides and get thinner? And so it's compressing, right, in the horizontal direction. So that's why when you have a number bigger than 1 on the outside, we talk about it as being a vertical stretch. But when it's on the inside, we talk about it as being a horizontal compression when those two things are really the same darn thing. It's just we like to always refer to uh, transformations of functions in terms of where the numbers occur. If we're doing things to the outside of the function, we describe them as manipulating the vertical, right? Manip manipulating the y values, manipulating the up and down. And if we do something on the inside, we're manipulating the horizontal, the x values, the left and right. So if we put that negative on the inside of the function, right, then it does a, a rotation, right? It flips it in the horizontal direction, so it flips it over the y-axis. These rules hold true for all functions. So we don't have to relearn everything for transformations of sine and cosine and transformations of trig functions because they're just functions. So when we start throwing numbers on the outside of the functions, we know what it does. When we put them on the inside, we know what it does, right? So if you have the general idea of how you can manipulate functions and you understand that, then you just apply it to trig functions, okay? So all that we really have to learn new about trig functions are their periods that they repeat, right? Because trig functions have a, a, a repetition to them. They have a pattern. And that's all that we have to learn that's new. So I'm going to go through all this stuff, but a lot of it's going to be review. So feel free to fast forward through the stuff that talks about shifts and, and stretches because we already know what those are from just knowing how they work with regular functions. All right. 
Why do we bother with this? Well, if we under, if we can understand a graph, we can understand the behavior of a function. So it's kind of important to know these things. Let's start with the graphs of sine and cosine. The first thing we want to do is recognize this period, right? Where does it repeat? And when we talk about looking at uh, graphs of our trig functions, we have to remember that sine and cosine are just giving us the x and y coordinates of points on the unit circle. As we travel around the unit circle in a counterclockwise fashion, wherever we stop, right, the angle that creates that is what we put into our trig functions, right? So this angle here, call it theta, we put that into a trig function, and what happens is sine gives us this vertical distance, and cosine just gives us this horizontal distance. That's all that's happening, okay? So sine and cosine are just giving us these distances, so we can see that we'll start getting repeat values as soon as we go all the way around the circle. And to go all the way around the circle is 2 pi. So it's going to repeat at every 2 pi. And so we just say it repeats at every 2 n pi because n is an integer. So if you let n be 1, it repeats at 2 pi. Then when you let n equal 2, it repeats at 4 pi and so on and so on and so on. Right? And then, of course, the same, uh, the same goes for cosine. Okay, So that's what it means to be a periodic function, that it repeats with some sort of... Um, fixed amount sine and cosine both repeat at 2 n pi so every 2 pi so we're just going to formalize that here and talk about that the period of sine and cosine is 2 pi okay now if we wanted to sketch graphs of functions we really only need to plot points Within that period, there's no point in plotting points beyond 2 pi because they're just going to be repetitions of things that happen between 0 and 2 pi. So you sit there and you start at 0 and you do all of the standard things, right? We know pi over 6, pi over 3, pi over 2, and then all multiples of that as we go around the unit circle and, and plot out all of those, those values. And then there is your first period of a function. So here you are doing sine where we plotted out all the values for pi over 6, pi over 3, pi over 2, and so on and so forth, until we got all the way to 2 pi, and we see that the, the first period looks like that, right? We get a little hump, and then it goes down into a valley. And we go, well, hey, this thing repeats, so repeat it, right? Put another one over here on the right, put another one over here on the left, and just keep doing it left and right as far as you want, and that's what the sine curve is going to look like. You repeat the process for the cosine curve, and when you plot all those points for cosine, you see that you start with like half of a hump, right? Then you get the valley, then you get the other half of the hump. So it's almost like the sine curve has been shifted. And that's what a lot of people think of when they look at these two graphs, is it's just one is a shift of the other. And technically, they absolutely are. I mean, when you look at the graph side by side, one is just a shift of the other by pi over two. So it's, um, it's very easy once you know how one looks that you just kind of shift it for the other but in any case here's our first period so then we just make another one put another one on this side right and we can keep doing this at infinitum okay now you may have noticed that the sine function is symmetric with respect to the origin and that makes sense because sine is an odd function and you may have noticed that the um, cosine function is symmetric with respect to the y-axis and that's because it's an even function all right, so we'll go take a look at it again. Cosine is symmetric with respect to the y-axis. Can you see that right here, this y-axis, it's a mirror image on each side of it. So we know that that is an even function. When they say sine is symmetric with respect to the origin, that means that if you drew a line through it at 45 degrees, that it would be symmetrical over that line. And can you kind of see if you tilt your head 45 degrees that this coming out of there and this coming out of there, they're exact mirrors of each other, right? It's, it's kind of if you if you flip it over the 45 and then flip it another 90 degrees, you're going to get the same curve. So if we first just flipped this part right here over this diagonal, we would get you know something that looks like this. And then if you take that and flip it 
over the other 45, you can see you get the purple one, right? So that's what it means to be symmetrical on the origin, is you kind of have to do a double flip. All right, what's next? How about graphing transformations of sine and cosine? Well, we already know how to do this because we already know how to uh, transform any function, right? We know very clearly that when we add 2 to the outside of a function, all that's going to do is shift it up by 2. We know that when we multiply on the outside by a negative number, all that's going to do is flip it right in the vertical direction. So it's going to look like that. And then we can start doing any combinations of these things we want. We throw a 2 on the outside, right? This is a, do you see that this is a 2 on the outside of the function, right? Because the function itself, the, the general function that we're starting with is just sine of x. And then what happens to sine of x when we put a 2 on the outside? Well, that stretches it in the vertical direction, right? You can see the red, red line over on the right. See how it's been stretched vertically? It's like you pulled on that string. And then how about if we make it 1 half? Well, again, it's on the outside, so it happens in the vertical. But instead of stretching, you see how it gets compressed? So the blue line is the standard sign, and now it's been pushed down. It's been compressed vertically, and so it's shorter. Makes sense. That's exactly what's supposed to happen with all functions. So we now know that if we put this A on the outside, it stretches things. You go, no, duh, I already knew that. Right? So we can play this game all day long. Put a negative 3 on the outside. It stretches and flips. Okay, what if we put some more stuff on it? We we'll put an A on the outside, but we can put this K on the inside. Well, all the K on the inside does, remember, is it does a compression or a stretch on the horizontal axis, right? But because these things are repetitious, because they have a period and because they repeat, instead of talking about it as being a compression or a stretch, which it is, we tend to describe it instead with what does it do to the period of the function? So a normal, in this case, sine or cosine function, we know repeats every 2 pi. But now we have this k in front of our x. So now we know that it's going to repeat between 0 and 2 pi for kx. So if we divide everything by k, right, because 0 divided by k is still 0, this gives me x, then I get 2 pi over k. So now this function is going to repeat from 0 to 2 pi over k. So you can see that all that happens when you put a k in there is it changes the period. You take the period and divide it by k. If k is a big number, right, bigger than 1, then you're dividing by a number bigger than 1, and then of course your period shrinks. And hey, it compresses, right? It repeats quicker, so it looks like you're kind of pushing inward on a spring and the coils are getting closer and closer together which makes it seem like it's taller, but it doesn't, right? Because these functions don't get taller unless you put numbers in front of them because of the whole repetition thing, right? The amplitude doesn't change. But that's where you get that compression that looks just like a stretch. And so that makes sense because it's bigger than 1. And then if it's smaller than 1, if we're, if we're uh, dividing by a number between 0 and 1, so a fraction. So if we divide by a small number, doesn't that make things bigger? And then, therefore, the period stretches out. And it's like you've pulled horizontally, right? You've stretched it out in the horizontal. And so here we go. The sine and cosine curves, we know they have a set amplitude. They have a maximum value of a and a minimum value of, sorry, maximum value of 1 and a minimum value of negative 1. But when you throw that little a out in front of it, all it does is stretch it in that direction. So now the new amplitude is whatever that number is. So instead of growing to 1 and, and to minus 1, it goes to a and minus a. So we talk about the amplitude as being the absolute value of a. Because if you put a, a negative 5 in front of that thing, you don't say the amplitude is negative 5. The height is still a 5. So that's why you just take the absolute value, because you just talk about it as a, you know, an absolute height. And then the period, the new period of the function, is always going to be the original period divided by k. And I like to say that instead of 2 pi divided by k, because 2 pi divided by k only works for sine and cosine, because those are the only two functions that we're talking about right now that have a period of 2 pi. What happens when we bring in another function that might have a period of, oh, I don't know, pi? then the period isn't 2 pi divided by k, it's pi divided by k, right? So to generalize it, the period is always the original period 
divided by k. So think about it that way instead of this whole 2 pi over k, because that's only true if your function has an original period of 2 pi, which sine and cosine do, but not all trig functions have periods of 2 pi. Okay, so here's more of those examples, right, that when we put a, a 2 in there for k, then we divide by 2 and we get pi, and it shrinks up just like we talked about, right? It's like we're compressing that spring. But then when we put a 1 half in there, we divide by a half, which is the same thing as multiplying by 2, which makes it 4 pi, and then it gets stretched out here on the right. So it's a horizontal stretch. The first one was a horizontal compression. Okay, so we can see that depending on what the k is, it, it, we can see very clearly that the function is getting stretched out. Instead of its period happening with the standard 2 pi, that's the one in black, we can shrink it up, right? And it can it can repeat in as you know a pi or even shorter, right? Make make it bigger and bigger and bigger. Or we can stretch it out and it repeats every 4 pi or every 6 pi or whatever we want, right? So it, it sky's the limit. Okay, amplitudes, we've already talked about. All it does is it stretches it out. So we can see very clearly that from this one here, the amplitude is going to be 4. So it's going to go up to a height of 4 and down to a height of negative 4. What's the amplitude of this second one going to be? How high is it going to go? Hopefully you're all going 2, duh, right? Or you haven't already fast forward through this because it's so simple, right? So there's amplitude of 4. There's the amplitude of 2. We can also talk about you know what happens to the period. Well, the first one, cosine of 3x, so it repeats at every 2 pi divided by 3. So that's why it repeats at 2 thirds pi. Right? So cosine member starts up here and then goes back up to there. And you can see that that happens at 2 thirds pi. And then the other one was sine of a half. So when you divide by a half, you end up multiplying by 2. And it, it repeats every 4 pi. So there it is, right? Starts in the middle. Right, starts at zero, it comes back to zero at four pi. Simple, easy, right? Nothing new. The last thing we're going to throw at you is horizontal movements, right? We already talked about shifting it up and down. Well, now we're going to shift it left and right with the whole minus b thing. Well, we already know what happens to that, right? We already know, and the reason why we write it as minus b is because it's counterintuitive. So we know if it's shifted to the right, if b is greater than 0, and shifted to the left, if b is less than 0. Simple, simple, simple. So we can put it all together and talk about all the manipulations of these functions as we stretch it, i.e. we mess with this amplitude. We, um, sorry, we stretch it vertically, which is messing with the amplitude. We stretch or compress horizontally, which messes with the period. We can shift it up and down, which is a vertical stretch, uh, shift, or we can shift it horizontally, and that we call a horizontal shift. Duh. Easy, simple, right? Put it all together. What happens with the sine curve? Well, this messes with the amplitude, shifts and uh, stretches it up to a 3. All right, now what about all this? Well, the uh, minus 4 pi, that does a horizontal shift. And then the 2 does a horizontal shift compression or stretch, right? you got to remember what happens. It's it's 2 pi divided by 2, so it's pi, so it gets compressed, right? And then when we talk about um, left and right shifts, we give them a special name. We call them a phase shift. And that's just because with these trig functions, um, they repeat, right? So they have phases. And it's kind of another word for their period. And so we're shifting that phase, okay? So here's what happened. It got stretched, so it goes up to 3. It got phase shifted over to pi over 4. And its period got messed with, and now it has a period of pi. Simple, easy stuff. We can do the same thing with this one, right? It's going to be uh, compressed vertically because this is less than 1. We have to factor this 2 out to figure out what the phase shift is. Because you might think the phase shift is 2 pi over 3, but it's not. It always has to be in this a format down here where it's a constant times x minus a number, right? So when you factor that 2 out, you're left with a pi over 3, and then you have to turn this plus into a minus minus, and so now it's in standard form, right? It's got to be in this standard form. It's got to be k on the outside of the parentheses in order to get that phase shift correct. And so now, when we have that, we can see that it's shifting, right? minus pi over 3, so it's shifting to the left by pi over 3, and it's being compressed, sorry, it's being uh, stretched out on its period 
that it's going to be 2 pi over um, 2, so it's going to uh, repeat at every pi. So if we go through all this, here's what it looks like. There's the height now. It goes up to 3 fourths and down to negative 3 fourths instead of plus and minus 1. Instead of um, starting at, you know, with the top being, so instead of this point here starting here, which is what cosine normally does, it's been horizontally shifted to the left. So that's why the phase, right, the kind of the beginning of the period, starts at negative pi over 3. And then that 2 tells me that the period is now pi instead of 2 pi. So we go from negative pi over 3 to 2 thirds because that's a total distance of pi. All right, well, we can also use graphing devices to graph trigonometric functions. So if you have a graphing calculator or you want to use some online graphing tools, by all means, you can always plug them into those. Um, they're very helpful. But, you know, the whole point of graphing functions isn't to graph the function. The whole point of graphing a function is to remind ourselves how functions are manipulated. So we're really reminding ourselves about the rules of shifts and stretches. And then it's also to give us a general idea of the overall shape of the function, which we already know what sines and cosines uh, look like. So throwing something into a calculator and getting the graph out of the calculator doesn't really help us because we already knew what the general shape was going to be like, and we could already kind of figure out what's happening to it just by the A and the B and the K, right, all those little bits and pieces. But if you are going to throw it into technology, you need to know how to mess around with the window so that you can actually see a full period of it and uh, move it around so you can actually see where it is because it's been shifted vertically or something like that, then it could you know, disappear from your window. So just keep that in mind. Here are some uh, typical examples of um, graphs of various things, and you can see what happens when you um, change your different viewing rectangles, what happens to the graph you get a, a really different look based on um, where you're going with your window. So that's why it's kind of good to know what the period is and things like that. It helps you get the window right. So whenever you um, are trying to graph a function, uh, the first thing you should do is figure out what the new period is, right? So start with the original period, divide by whatever the K is, get the new period, figure out what that is roughly as a decimal. And then you should set your window to something that you know sees that properly. So this would be a better example of that, of you know, a better way to set your viewing window. Okay. Um, I don't want to waste a lot of time on this because you know technology really doesn't help us learn anything. It's just uh, it's a crutch, but go ahead and use it. Um, in general, right here are our formulas we're talking about where we're finding um, a times sine and blah blah blah. Well, we could also make it a of x. We could make it a function. So now we're we're stretching it by a function, which means it, it its height will be stretched at different uh, heights depending on where we are, depending on what that function is. And that is a whole other ball of wax, guys. Um, but just think about it for a second. Instead of taking it and constantly stretching it by a factor of three because we threw a three in front of it, what if you threw an x squared in front of it? Right? So when x equals zero, the function goes away because it has a height of zero. When x equals one, you're stretching it by a factor of one. But when x equals two, you're stretching it by a factor of four. And when x equals three, you're stretching it by a factor of nine. So you can you see that that stretch would get bigger and bigger and bigger, and your sine curve would kind of blow up as you went to the right, and it would it would look like a, a trumpet or a flute, right? Because those oscillations would start off at the origin and they'd be really small because you know x is small and then they're going to get bigger and bigger and taller and taller and excuse my horrible drawing but you get the idea right it's going to bounce higher and lower because as you go out your x is getting bigger and bigger if you had x squared as that you know a of the x function so here's an example of now cosine is the function in front of cosine so you kind of it's it's like a snake eating its tail right 
but you could throw this thing into technology and let it do it for you. But basically all that's happening is the amplitude of the cosine of 16 pi, because that's the second one, right? So this function's amplitude is being dictated by this first function, and that first function has a maximum and minimum value, right? Because there's no number in front of it. So even this is just messing with the period. We know that the maximum and minimum values for cosine is 1 and minus 1. So all that's happening is the normal amplitude of your cosine function is being shrunken and then brought back to normal. Shrunken and then brought back to normal because all it does is go between 1 to minus 1. So it shrinks, goes back to normal, shrinks and flips, right, when it becomes minus. And so all sorts of weird stuff is happening here. Okay, we could have done it by hand if we wanted to, but really, um, that's that's more than we need to worry about for most classes. So feel free to throw it into technology for for most of the time. And then here's another example where we talk about sine of x divided by x. Well, that's really being multiplied by one over x. So the amplitude is a one over x, and we know that one over x, as x gets bigger and bigger and bigger, you're dividing right by bigger and bigger in numbers. So remember that previous example I showed you guys, where the flute got bigger and bigger and bigger. Do you see how this one's getting smaller and smaller and smaller? Right, the the um, the bumps are getting shorter and shorter, and it's going to level off in both directions because you're dividing by that x. And then if we wanted to kind of figure out what's going on um, at certain places and figure out what the value is close to zero, because we know we can't evaluate this function at zero because you're dividing by zero and that doesn't work, right? You can't divide by zero. It should be undefined. But when you zoom in on this thing, you can see that it seems to approach one on both sides. As we get closer and closer to zero on both sides, this function actually seems to approach 1. And this is a very important fact in calculus. You'll actually, if you go on to calculus, you'll learn how to find that. You'll, you'll take the limit as this function approaches 0, and you'll see that the limit actually does, in fact, equal 1. And there are techniques you will learn that will let you um, actually solve that. And so this is what we were talking about before, where instead of dividing by x we can just multiply by 1 over x and then now we really understand that that amplitude is being controlled by that function 1 over x all right so a lot of stuff i sped through some of it because um, i don't want you guys to get too caught up in thinking this is new stuff because it isn't right it's just back to the same old stuff we already knew that when we do stuff on the outside it affects the vertical when we do stuff on the inside it affects the horizontal and all that really changes is that we give them do new names instead of talking about vertical stretches we talk about messing with the amplitude right and instead of talking about horizontal stretches and shifts we talk about it as messing with the period right and instead of being a left and right shift we talk about it as a phase shift but it's all the same stuff all right, hope that helps.